Order. It's now time for order, members. Uh, now time for question time. Before I call the minister, uh, members will be aware that the minister for infrastructure has issued a written ministerial statement, which is embargoed until noon tomorrow. I'm aware that there is a listed question today on a related topic. Should it be reached in light of uh, previous rulings and the Speaker's response to Mr Swan's point of order at the start of this sitting, members uh, may ask questions and should take their steer on the extent of the embargo from the Minister. Can I also say that, uh, can I also remind members <coughs> uh, that, uh, of the Speaker's ruling in relation to supplementary questions? Supplementary questions should contain no more than one inquiry be brief and relevant to the lead question and not be read out. I hope that is clear. Uh, it's time for, uh, for questions to the Minister for uh, Infrastructure, and we'll start with listed questions. I now call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question one, please. My department provides the necessary funding and investment to enable NI Water to carry out its water and sewage functions whilst protecting our environment. The Executive's current one-year budget for 2016-17 has allocated, through my department, £147 million for investment in water and sewage services. Since the creation of NI Water in 2007, continued investment in wastewater treatment has resulted in significant improvements in the level of compliance with environmental discharge standards. NI Water is very mindful of the important role it plays in the protection of the local environment and it operates an environmental management system to minimise the risk of chemical discharges from its assets. Targets for reducing the number of high and medium pollution incidents are set by the NI Authority for Utility Regulation as part of the price control process, which involves consultation with the Environment Agency. Year on year, progress has consistently been delivered by NI Water in this area, outperforming the targets that are set. NI Water has invested nearly £500 million over the last three years, specifically to improve the sewage network system and wastewater treatment works. With ongoing investment, NI Water will continue to improve wastewater services for the people of the North. I call uh, Shania Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you uh, to the Minister for your answer. And I would ask the Minister, considering that there have been at least three incidents of river pollution and one in the constituency of South Down, which I'm proud to serve. Can the Minister outline whether NI Water have inspected all water treatment plants? And is he satisfied that the level of fines imposed on NI Water are adequate? Minister. Thank you, Member, for the question. And certainly, you know, I, I was actually I was in China at the time of the particular spill you were referring to and liaised closely with the department officials to ensure what sort of a uh, clean-up uh, program was put in place, and I certainly met with NI, official, NI Water officials uh, on my return to find out. Following NI Water's detailed investigation into the pollution incident at Ansborough, and we're both obviously alluding to Ansborough Wastewater Treatment Works, NI Water has undertaken to examine the dosing pipe arrangements at all other wastewater treatment works where liquid storage units are being used, and replace plastic pipe fittings with stainless steel fittings as appropriate. NI Water has also checked the spill protection provision at all sites where processed chemicals are used and if additional capacity or alternative arrangements are required, it will carry out any remedial work required. The company has also undertaken to survey drainage plans at wastewater treatment work sites where processed chemicals are being used to ensure that the pipework configuration enables all spillages to be contained within the site. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Minister, I want to refer to the, the Cotton River in my constituency of North Down, which is suspected to be the source of pollution in the Ballyhome Bay and has caused the, the failure of that beach to, to reach standards. I understand that there is a wastewater pumping station at uh, Cotton, uh, and I understand also that Northern Ireland Water have been recently fined, I think it was £2,000, for a pollution incident in that river. Uh, does the Department have any plans? Uh, to eliminate this uh, problem of this emergency overflow directly into the river. Thank you. Minister. I thank the member for raising and whilst I'm not 
specifically aware of the, the particular uh, site and, and river the member is referring to. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to correspond with the member on that particular one. It is very clear that whilst we have, a, you know, has been a huge uh, decrease in these level incidents over the years, that we must do as much as we can and certainly go as far as we can to ensure these type of pollution incidents do not occur. Uh, and we need to take all available steps we can to do so. I call Dr. Stephen Farry. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister is talking about the amount of money he is investing in improving the, the infrastructure, but does he also recognise that the nature of governance uh, in terms of Northern Ireland water actually constrains the ability to, of the executive to invest as much as possible, uh, given that NA Water does not have bar borrowing powers? And what plans does he have to address that, bearing in mind that the Assembly recently is, was very concerned whenever ONS tried to reclassify housing associations and take away their borrowing rights? No, sir. I thank the member, and certainly as a former minister, he'll be well aware of the need of all departments to look and explore ways in which we can increase the potential and the ability of our arm's length organisations and government companies uh, to do what it can to deliver. There is no doubt that there are huge challenges, especially in the resource side, for a number of our bodies right across, not just my department, but across the entire government. Uh, and we need to be innovative and creative around how uh, we go about doing this. Uh, NI Water have ambitious capital plans, uh, you know, certainly not just for the city of Belfast, but right across, that will take it into the hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds over the next number of years. Uh, I have started discussions with uh, NI Water officials to see how best we can meet those demands in the years ahead. Thank you. We move on to the next question. Before doing so, uh, can I advise members that question 12 is withdrawn? Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister. I can confirm that my department is actively working towards introducing residence parking schemes. As you may be aware, earlier this year I announced the start of a consultation period with residents in the Rossville Street area of Derry for a residence parking scheme. You will also be aware that my department has proposals for schemes in the Lower Malone and College Park Avenue Rugby Road areas of Belfast. I hope also to make an announcement on these schemes later this week. Transport NI officials are aware of a number of requests for a residence parking scheme in Pakenham Street and have recently discussed the issue at a meeting with the member and the Donegal Pass Community Forum on local residents. A scheme for the Pakenham Street area is dependent on the successful implementation of the initial residence parking schemes that were outlined before. Supplementary, Mr. Stolford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. The Minister will be aware that uh, the residents of Pakenham Street uh, are now living on the doorstep of a huge student accommodation development that's taking place. And if anywhere meets the criteria for a residence parking scheme, it is that part of the town. So I would urge the Minister to work closely, uh, not only Pakenham Street, but also the other areas that he has named to progress this issue that's really, really wanted in South Belfast. Was there a question there? Uh, I, I agree entirely with the member. Uh, you know, I, I am disappointed that when the legislation was introduced in 2007, that at this stage, nine years later, we're looking at the situation that we're only on the verge of introducing our first parking schemes. I think we need to do more. Uh, I have certainly set my officials the task to do more and approach these in a problem-solving uh, mood that you know, certainly we need to overcome objections, not just simply shelve something because of objections. The one thing I would say, of course, is I think the figures for the Donegal Pass uh, was something around a 14% response to the initial consultation, with Pakenham Street being about 18%. We need to see a greater consultation, a greater engagement with local communities wanting to. And of course, political reps also have a role to play in this, to be out front uh, and to lead it. And I'm, I am aware that the member is trying to do that, certainly in that particular area, because uh, we want want to see more of that. We need to see leadership from local political reps to drive some of these uh, particular schemes forward. Thank you. I call Claire Hanna. And thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can the Minister advise what he sees as the next steps for the Lower Malone and the College Park and Rugby Road schemes? And are there any plans to review the consultation process, which currently can be derailed by as few as one objections from people who don't uh, even uh, live in or have an interest in the area? Minister. Well, the next step is they'll be making an announcement later this week. So, without prejudice in what I'll say later this week, uh, I'll leave it at that. But as I outlined to the previous member, I think we need to do more. I think objections can stall some of these projects and literally nearly put a dead hand on them. And that's not just with regards to parking schemes, it's with regard to you know, significant safety upgrades, the likes of the A26 
uh, and uh, we need to find a way to engage properly, of course, with objections and to listen to people. Um, but I think we need to find a way to move forward, especially with residence parking schemes. It says 2007 till now is far too long. They've had to wait uh, for some of these schemes to come live. And certainly I will be doing all that I can in the, in the years ahead to ensure we move forward with something. I'd rather try something and it didn't work and go back to the drawing board and try it again than to sit with none because we can't get total agreement on the way forward. Thank you. I call Fran McCann. Uh, I'll last count caller. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his, uh, uh, his answers up to now. Uh, but uh, would the Minister uh, give some details, and I don't want him to be preempting uh, a statement later in the week, uh, of any free uh, residence parking schemes that he may have in place? Minister. <laughs> The, the policy for introduction of residence parking schemes was introduced in 2007 by the then Department for Regional Development. Since that time, despite considerable effort, no schemes have been implemented due largely to a lack of local support from residents concerned. Despite this, my department is currently developing residence parking schemes in Derry and Antrim, as well as the two Belfast schemes in the College Park Avenue, Rugby Road area and Lower Malone area. In line with the current budgetary constraints faced by all departments, these schemes will generally have to be introduced at a full cost recovery basis, which will require a charge to be levied for a parking permit. The exception to this being any scheme line either wholly or partially in a neighbourhood renewal area, which will be exempt from the permit charge. Where there is a charge levied, this has been set at £30 per residence permit and is intended to cover the cost of the scheme design and the enforcement needed to stop others from outside the area parking there. Thank you. I call Mr Smith. Philip Smith. Mr. Speaker, uh, would the Minister agree with me that decisions relating to parking uh, are best decided at a local level uh, and would he therefore support the devolution of these powers to local councils? Minister. <laughs> I see what he's done there. Uh, no, I, I think when it comes to parking especially, instead of a, a patchwork uh, approach to this by local councils, I think the central government still needs to take a strategic view uh, of parking policies to ensure that right across, because parking, when, when we take into effect that the, uh, especially on-street parking can have such an impact on traffic flows and congestion, uh, and that certainly my department is responsible for, for a way forward and a strategic way forward for that. It's important that we have all tools at our disposal, uh, and I certainly think that working alongside local government, uh, we can come up with policies that are fit for purpose. Move on to the next question. I call Conor Murphy. Number three, last Concordia. Question number three. Last week, I published Exercise, Explore, Enjoy, a strategic plan for greenways, which sets out my vision for a region where people have ready access to a safe, traffic-free environment for health, active travel, and leisure. The plan provides a framework to assist councils to develop their own local schemes as part of a greenway network for the north. It proposes both a primary greenway network and a secondary greenway network, which links together the entire region. It also includes cross-border links from Derry to County Donegal, Enniskillen to Sligo, and Armagh to Clonus, and Newry to Dundalk. This is the first step towards creating a world-class greenway network, which will be a welcome investment in rural development and active travel providing for leisure and recreation, creating long-term employment and entrepreneurs opportunities, and enhancing opportunities for tourism. The strategic plan is not just about words and intentions. Alongside the plan, I announced 20 small grants to councils under the Small Grants Programme for Greenways, where I am providing a grant of up to £8,000 towards the cost of a greenway feasibility study. Providing support to councils in the development of greenways helps to increase safety for people using bikes, a key objective in the bicycle strategy. The use of active travel is also an aspiration included in the programme for government, and better designed greenways are important in laying the foundations for longer, healthier, more active lives. Mr Murphy. Concord, I thank the Minister for his response, and uh, he will know that there has been a widespread welcome for the uh, initiative that he, he launched last week, uh, and particularly in my own area where the, the Greenway, uh, as he will be familiar with, uh, alongside the Carlingford Lock, uh, will connect with the Ballock Glass, uh, which goes from Carlingford uh, to O'Meath, uh, and creates a potential linkage right away from Portadown down to Carlingford. Uh, so it is a very welcome uh, scheme indeed. What in total resource has the Minister set aside uh, to deliver on this uh, project? Minister. 
Uh, the first element of funding is the 20 schemes that I have supported through a small grant of £8,000 towards the cost of a feasibility study along each route, so £160,000. Following receipt of the feasibility studies, up to four of the highest quality proposals will be offered a grant of up to £25,000 to develop the detailed design further. Although this is only a small amount of funding, it will help councils to start the work of developing their local schemes within the framework for the strategic plan for greenways. The strategic plan sets out a vision for the next 10 years, and there is a need to develop scheme plans over the next two or three years. Funding for greenways is also available through the Interreg programme, and I would expect that a number of the cross-border projects may well be successful in securing financial support. For future years, I have some capital funding in my departmental plans, and I will seek to secure capital funding on top of that going forward. There is no doubt that money is tight, but we must ask ourselves the questions, <laughs> can we afford not to invest in greenways? And although roads projects very often hog the limelight, it is greenways and other active travel initiatives that are truly transformative projects for communities as well as personally for individuals. Thank you. I call uh, Sandra Overend. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for, uh, for this information. In fact, it would be nice to see some greenways uh, across the constituency of Mid-Ulster. Um, but my question is, would the Minister consider uh, supporting the extension of a cycle hire scheme outside of Belfast? that would allow for greater usage of greenways? Minister. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if there is merit, and I have no doubt that there probably would be merit in a number of locations. Uh, you know, one of the great strengths of uh, a project like this, of course, is we connect all parts of the north into our large towns and our cities. And as I said, these can be truly transformative projects and uh, community spaces uh, for individuals as well as communities right across the north. So I'm more than happy. I don't have any particular plans for bicycle hire schemes outside of Belfast. Uh, that, you know, they are a, 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 an item for the Belfast City Council, but I'm more than happy to look at them if the member wants to bring them forward. Thank you. I call uh, William Humphreys. Thank you, Minister, for his answer so far. The Minister will be aware that the Committee for Infrastructure recently visited the Conswater Greenway, and I very much um, praise what has been an excellent joined-up uh, government in terms of local government, regional government and outside funders as well. Does the Minister agree with me that further collaboration between councils, but in particular um, rural um, tourism partnerships which councils come together, is a way forward in providing the economies of scale that can allow Conswater green, uh, Greenways, perhaps not on that scale, but something along those lines across Ulster uh, for the benefit of our constituents? Minister. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if I take my own particular uh, part of the world in, in South Town, uh, two of the proposals would link the you know, highly uh, sought tourism area of Newcastle and the Mourne area into the Conswater area. Uh, I have no doubt that the local council working alongside Belfast City Council will want to develop tourism potential along that. That used to be the, the old Belfast and County Down Railway, which was a highly popular uh, travel by train for tourists, uh, if not just for the North Down coastline, but down into as I say, the Mourne area. So I have no doubt that this type of project will be able to reawaken some of that uh, tourism value in the area. You, we only have to look at what's taken place in the west of Ireland with the Great Western uh, Greenway, which is bringing in tens of millions of euros now to local communities that until this point maybe were on their knees economically, small regional towns that are now coming back to life. So there, there is no reason why we can't do the same here in the north. Uh, move on to the next question. Uh, call Mr Cahill Boylan. Kesh Deveri Cahar, let a hold question number four, please. The North-South Ministerial Council have agreed a phased approach to the restoration of the Ulster Canal. Phase 1 of the restoration of the south-western stretch of the Ulster Canal from Loch Erne to Clonus is now underway and covers the 2.5 kilometres from Loch Erne to Castle Saunderson. This is expected to be completed in 2017. It is planned to issue a tender shortly for the next stage involving the construction of Derry Kerra Bridge and the canal section. This will enable commencement of construction in spring 2017 with an estimated contract period of 18 months. The member will also be aware that as part of the Fresh Start Stormont Agreement and Implementation Plan, the Executive and the Irish Government agreed to undertake a review to identify options for jointly developing future phases of the Ulster Canal restoration project. In line with this, officials from my department and the Department of Arts, Heritage, Regional, Rural and Giltock the Firs are currently finalising a paper for consideration by ministers at the NSMC plenary to be held in Armagh this Friday. The paper will set out options for further development of the Ulster Canal restoration project. 
To inform this process, I, alongside Minister Humphreys, established the Ulster Canal Advisory Forum to explore and examine ways to support and help advance the Ulster Canal project, examine possible funding options for the project, including existing funding streams in place in public bodies and also EU schemes that are open for applications for funding, consider the potential for private sector investment and patronage from philanthropic societies. The forum consists of representatives from the local councils, sponsor departments and Waterways Ireland. Interested stakeholders from other organisations will be invited to attend future meetings of the forum as appropriate. The inaugural meeting with which Minister Humphreys and I chaired was held on the 23rd of September. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Just to follow on from uh, that, the Minister mentioned the advisory forum. Could he uh, indicate who the stakeholders are on that forum or who intends to invite on that forum? Commissioner Morgan. Uh, the following stakeholders are represented on the Ulster Canal Advisory Forum. Both sponsor departments, Monaghan County Council, Fermanagh District Council, Cavan County Council and Waterways Ireland. Each council will be represented by two elected representatives and one official. Interested stakeholders from other organisations will be invited to attend meetings of the forum as appropriate. These include, but are not of course confined to, Falchia Ireland, NI Tourist Board, Strategic Investment Board, the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government, uh, SUPP, and of course Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon for Council. Thank you. I call uh, Richie McPhillips. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister give us an update on the total spend to date in and around the Derry Kerb and Butler area on this project? Minister. I'm sorry, I don't have those details in front of me, but I'll correspond with the member. Thank you. I call Jenny Palmer. Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister also for his answer thus far. Could the Minister give an assessment of what impact a reopened Ulster Canal would have on income derived from tourism to the area? in comparisons to the regeneration and maintenance costs? Minister. Certainly, well, you know, such analysis will be very much part of any business case and the, the economic impact of such works going forward, but there's no doubt, uh, especially when you speak to Waterways Ireland, uh, when you look at the development of especially blueways as well as our greenway potential right across the, uh, the island of Ireland, uh, that there is huge potential in the restoration of the Ulster Canal. I think that's why we've given it the focus uh, we have. Uh, when you consider that, and we, we touched on this, I suppose, with the greenways as well, uh, that very often these old canal uh, lines, uh, and same with our old railway lines, are in the, I use the phrase all the time, are sleeping relics of the past. By bringing these alive, will have a massive impact upon local communities, uh, especially many local communities in those particular areas that have been devastated uh, by the economic recession. Uh, and as the likes of tourism can breathe new life into it, uh, and I think it will have a hugely positive effect on local communities. So if you take a town like Clonus, uh, once a bustling market town uh, that people would have come to uh, from all corners, uh, I think there's great potential for the Ulster Canal to breathe new life into a town like Clonus. Thank you. Move on to the next question. Can I remind what members wishing to ask a supplementary question to keep rising in their places? Question number five. I call Doug Biddy. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Minister. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions 5 and 10 together. Uh, my department has a statutory duty to promote and improve road safety and does this through a wide range of rolling road safety educational activities and engineering initiatives. Children and young people are amongst the most vulnerable groups using our roads and as such must be taught how to use our roads safely, both in the vicinity of schools and beyond in the wider community. Given that over 95 per cent of road traffic collisions where someone is killed or seriously injured or due to human error, my department challenges driver behaviour through the road safety campaigns, reminding drivers of their responsibility to themselves and other road users. Various protective engineering interventions have also been developed over the years through a range of initiatives that have culminated in the production of Transport NI's policy and procedure guide that traffic engineers can draw from when assessing safety at individual schools. These measures include provision of enhanced signing and road markings, central islands, laybys, and traffic calming features such as road humps. The enhanced signing largely incorporates flashing lights programmed to operate during term times at school opening and closing times. A more recent innovation has been the development of part-time 20 mile an hour speed limits at schools, especially at schools and roads where the national speed limit applies. 
The speed limit of these schools is reduced to 20 miles an hour at school opening and closing times during term times. I am particularly keen on this approach, however the initial schemes have been expensive, expensive to provide. I have therefore asked my officials to consider refinements of the measure and seek a more cost-effective approach that would facilitate an increased provision of these 20 miles an hour. I remain committed to continuing to work towards reducing deaths and serious injuries on our roads, especially amongst vulnerable road users such as school children. I recognise the continuing challenges of preventing road deaths and serious injuries, and as such, my department will continue to address the issues using all practical methods. Mr. Peter, supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for, for a, a very clear um, and full answer. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and like many of my um, uh, many of our members of the Assembly here, we are concerned uh, about our children and, and outside of uh, schools. In my own constituency area, we have a rural school with a 40 mile an hour speed limit outside in a dangerous area. And in our urban schools, uh, the parking outside of it is near gridlocked. So I wonder if the, the, the Minister would consider promoting a society mindset change uh, in creating a 20 mile an hour speed limit outside of all of our sco schools as standard and making clear ways in front of our schools uh, at the uh, start of school and at the end of school. Minister. I thank the, the member for, for his comments, not just the question, of course. And I, I will certainly continue to do all that I can, certainly to promote uh, the message that we must take care around our schools. Um, I suppose one of the things about the 20 mile an hour around the urban schools is that very often there is traffic coming in place in urban settings and traffic speeds do tend, because of congestion also, uh, do tend to be quite low around urban schools. Uh, we have seen to date that you know, in those schools, on perhaps particularly in rural roads where the national speed limit applies, it is a particular danger. But of course, I have to operate within the legislation. I have to, it's not enough just to say this. I have to set down a process that fits with the law, uh, and that it's not enough just to have a speed roundel up if it has no legislative weight behind it. So we need to find a way that does both. But absolutely, I have no problem championing um, from any, any time that I do, uh, and my department does, the opportunity to say to people to take care around schools, to be aware that there's vulnerable people uh, accessing that. Uh, and as I say, if we, we do that in all of us, there's a responsibility in all of us, as I say, um, you know, where, where death or, fi or serious injury is caused by, by a road traffic collision, 95% of the time it's because of human error. It, it is up to us to make the change. Thank you. I call Carl Nicullen. Last can call you. I suppose in a similar theme, um, Ara, it's just a, if you could give us a brief outline of some of the initiatives that are currently underway in schools around road safety. My department provides a range of resources and schemes to be used by teachers to enable them to improve and embed road safety behaviours in children and young people. Among the others, these initiatives include the Road Safety Teaching Aid Calendar, a copy of which hangs on the wall of every classroom and nursery in the north. The Enhanced Cycling Proficiency Scheme is being delivered in schools, and to date this year, approximately 320 schools and 7,500 children have been trained. The Junior Road Safety Officer Scheme continues to grow in popularity, with more schools registering to join the scheme. Education packs are available in both hard copy and electronic version on the Teachers ICT Network, C2K. These initiatives have been well received, and for the most part, recent initiatives, early indications show a positive response. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answers today. Does the Minister recognise that there are lists within the divisional offices of proposed remedial works outside our schools that have sat and moved nowhere for many years? And does he now recognise that, that funding needs to be a priority to move forward these schemes? Minister. Yeah, well, I suppose to be frank, there, there are lists within all other divisions of particular works that do carry, and you know, we prioritise and divisions prioritise, of course, on a number of criteria, you know, prime of which will, of course, be road safety. Uh, but, as I say, the, the, the pot of money uh, is only so much. Um, you know, I am aware of some divisions where there are dozens of schemes uh, that, if money allowed, we could roll out. We have to continue to assess uh, and, and to spend our money appropriately. But there can be no doubt, and certainly in my time ahead and the years ahead, uh, road safety has to be paramount and certainly has to be prioritised top of the list. I call Jerry Mullen. 
Minister, I'm aware that in my constituency there are many families who live just outside the three-mile threshold for free bus passes, uh, and because of that they have to walk uh, across very dangerous roads to get to school. Uh, would you consider you know, having a look at the criteria again in that regard? Minister? For free school bus passes, sorry? Yeah, that, that certainly doesn't fall within my remit. I call Chris Little. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what level of investment he will be making in the Safe Routes to School programme and whether he will introduce Level 2 on road cycle training for all uh, P6 and P7 pupils in Northern Ireland to encourage active travel choices to school? Minister. Uh, I, I will be looking at both actually in the time ahead. Uh, and whilst we enter this budgetary period, it's not right probably for me to put a figure on the amount of money I will be spending. Certainly, uh, safer routes to school, uh, improved road safety around schools, especially our primary schools, uh, is something that will very much be part uh, of my considerations. With regards to higher proficiency for cyclists, uh, it's something I've believed in actually for a long time, uh, and something I will, in, in due course, touch with the Education Minister, that if we can build it in to the to a child's learning at an early phase, um, certainly even if the child doesn't go on to, to be a cyclist on the road themselves, whenever they're driving, they will have, be, have a better awareness of all road users, and I think it's something that we can build in uh, to the school curriculum at an early stage. I call Mr Jim Allister for a quick supplementary, followed by um, an equally quick answer. Can the Minister expand on what he was suggesting about the, the 20 mile an hour limit? Is he minded to make that easier to attain? Because there are many rural schools, and recently uh, I was thinking of the Diamond Primary School near Covey Becky, where that is an issue, and yet there seems to be a funding blockage. Minister. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, I want, especially in those, for those primary schools uh, on a rural setting, that the national speed limit applies. Uh, I want to make it easier to, to be able to achieve the 20 mile an hour status uh, on those rural roads. Uh, but I want to do it in such a way that the, the speed restriction carries legal weight uh, and that it's simply not a suggestion, but it is actually uh, a requirement for the driver to drive at that speed uh, at the school opening and closing times. Thank you. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister outline whether he plans to restore the fuel duty rebate uh, for Translink NI, which is the only public transport operator in the UK that does not receive such a uh, rebate? Minister. Yeah, as, as I mentioned to a previous question, certainly. It would be inappropriate ahead of the budget uh, process over the next number of weeks and months uh, to, develop, to delve into uh, certain uh, policies such as that, but it's something I have discussed with TransLink officials and, and the union uh, in recent weeks and will be part of discussions going forward. Supplementary, Mr McGrath. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that obviously some of the only ways to offset TransLink's budget deficit then may be to either stop senior smart passes, to cut bus services or to raise fares. Would that cause the Minister concern if that's what was to happen? Minister. There is no doubt that uh, all of my arm things bodies are coming under increasing pressure. When, when we look at the effects uh, of Tory austerity over, over the last five years or more, uh, and certainly the the words that we're hearing out of the Tory conference and, and the mood music from London is that we're we set to face into another decade of austerity coming forward. That's going to put huge pressure on our budgets, especially on the resource side. So be it TransLink, be it NI Water or Transport NI, there are huge pressures there. We know that. We know in Transport NI uh, that we have a structural maintenance backlog of some £1 billion over the last number of years. It's something we have to address. Uh, but I have to be sure to do it in such a way that uh, I'm not robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, and that I am able to balance my resource budget right across, which delivers services that we all need in our society. But certainly, we don't want to be looking down an angle of leaving those people in rural areas who already suffer from a sense of isolation in many cases to be more isolated. I call Mr. Raymond Khan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister how he squares the uh, answer he gave earlier to Ms Sinead Bradley with regard to the adequacy of funding uh, of Northern Ireland Water uh, with the evidence given last week by uh, Northern Ireland Water CEO Sarah Venning's uh, statements to the uh, Infrastructure Committee that without significantly increased funding Northern Ireland Water is unable to guarantee the quality or adequacy of drinking water into the future. Minister. 
Uh, thank the member for his comments. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, and I'll check Hansard for this, but I don't think I've ever uttered the phrase that I believe that the, the sums are adequate. Uh, again, uh, you know, I, I outlined some of the hundreds of millions of pounds that NI Water are investing into some of these capital works. Uh, while this is to be welcomed, we need to see going forward uh, much more investment. But as, as, as my answer to the previous question, you know, our budgets are coming under huge pressure from Tory austerity in London. We, we know the impacts of tens of millions of pounds being taken out of the block grant, and that has that, that them, them reductions have had to come from somewhere. So going forward, I certainly want to be able to give uh, as much uh, money as I can to organisations such as NI Water. We rely on, on good water and good wastewater services, and that's something we need to maintain going forward. Mr. McCann, supplementary. Well, I, in light of that, Minister, I will send you uh, the Hansard report of exchanges uh, between. Uh, Ms. Uh, Venning uh, and myself, and I will underline, sort of, uh, uh, if you will allow me, sort of the point at which she agreed with me, sort of that without significantly increased funding, she cannot guarantee the quality of drinking water, the continuation of the supply, or the management of wastewater. Are you not being a wee bit complacent here, Minister? Minister. Uh, I'm sure Ms. Venning would love plenty more money. I, I wish I had more money to give Ms. Venning, but unfortunately that is not the situation we are in. Uh, as I said, going forward, uh, I will work, continue to work with NI Water to work with the regulator also as well, so we get as much resources as we possibly can afford to NI Water to be able to deliver the service we have. Uh, NI Water uh, you know, ranks comparable to the vast majority of water providers uh, across Europe. Uh, and does an outstanding job. In fact, I think the improvement with NI Water over the last number of years has been a huge success. Uh, and as I say, I think we should put that on record here today. I call Mr. Paul Gervin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. It's in relation to uh, a proposed development on a quarry site in the village of Parkgate on the Connor Road in Parkgate. Uh, it will have significant uh, vehicular impact upon a village with hundreds of HGVs uh, and on the application it indicates hundreds of HGVs going through it on a daily basis to access this site. Has the Minister had an opportunity to look at how that would impact greatly upon uh, village life in Parkgate? Minister. Uh, I have not had a, an opportunity to, to, to look at that. Uh, you know, I have no doubt the planners will of course take all of those uh, particular circumstances and uh, likelihoods into effect uh, when ruling on any particular uh, planning application. Uh, but the member is right. We do know that as much as we want to um, you know, promote and to encourage growth, and especially in rural areas, we need to ensure that local towns and local villages are not affected by uh, a mass increase in uh, industrial traffic. Uh, but I am sure that this is something that the, the, the planning process will take full effect of. Mr. Garvin, supplementary. I, I thank the minister for his answer. I appreciate that his department it will not it's not being dealt with at a local level. It has been dealt with at a departmental level. This application, and as a consequence, there is a number of areas where I, I just would like to know the the minister's view in relation to inclusion of what is termed as passing bays on third-party land that the applicant Webby has no control over. Is it is it proper to actually do that? on a major application. Yes. I think it would probably be more appropriate for myself uh, and the member to correspond on this particular uh, issue uh, so as not to prejudice any final decision that myself and my department will be making uh, in this particular application. I call Mr Ian Millen. Can I ask the Minister up to give us an update on progress uh, with the Rural Roads Initiative? At the whole? As the member is aware, following the additional capital funding prioritised by the Executive for structural maintenance as part of June monitoring, I listened to concerns about the deterioration in rural roads, and I earmarked some £10 million for resurfacing of rural roads right across the north. The Rural Roads Initiative is a significant investment and is helping to address the rural roads in the worst condition, therefore helping to reduce a backlog of rural road resurfacing and repairs. The improvements are targeting many short lengths of rural roads, in particular poor condition, and it is estimated that around 1,000 locations on the rural road network will be improved. Transport NI divisions have now finalised their programmes, with work well underway in most areas, as at the end of October, approximately 400 schemes have been completed across all divisions. Mr. Millen, supplementary. Kuramilamagata, Alaskan Kuller, August Mabuikas Fosta, Don Ira. 
thanks uh, very much, uh, Principal or Deputy Speaker, and the Minister also. Thank you. Uh, does the Minister agree that maintaining rural, rural roads is as important as the main network? Minister. Absolutely. Maintaining the structural integrity of the entire road network is essential for social and economic well-being right across the north and is a high priority for my department. In this difficult financial period, it is of course necessary to prioritise resources, but for too long rural communities have dropped down the priority list. The Rural Roads Initiative goes some way to addressing that imbalance and dealing the, ma and dealing the maintenance backlogs that have developed over recent times. Rural constituencies right across the north will soon be able to see the benefits. The initiative will, of course, not solve all of the problems on our roads, but I believe it is a very positive measure to address a clear need in our rural communities. I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, uh, Minister, you had a meeting last week with a high-level delegation from China. Would you be in a position to update the House on that exchange? Minister. Yes, uh, we, we had uh, visitors from the China Investment Corporation, Chairman Ding and, and his team, uh, and this followed on the back of my visit to China, where in Beijing I had the pleasure of meeting President Tu of that particular investment uh, agency. Uh, we met with the, the Deputy First Minister uh, and Invest in I, amongst other um, people. Uh, I'm delighted to say it was very positive. Uh, I think the executive have taken great steps in recent years to develop links with China uh, and to continue to develop those links in, in the years ahead will be very, very important, uh, especially on the back of the opening councillors in Beijing and uh, offices here in Belfast. Uh, that's something that's important to do. Uh, and so far to date, the message has been very positive from, from the Chinese. Uh, you know, we talk, touched upon not just infrastructure projects, but of course um, the great desire, I think, in, in China. That they see the quality of our, our organic food and agri-food businesses here in the north. So we had very positive engagement, and it's something I hope to continue along into the future. Mr. McAleer. Minister, for his answer. Does the Minister envisage that there will be further contact with the Chinese uh, regarding investment? Thank you. Yeah, as I have outlined, um, certainly, you know, I certainly intend, as Minister for Infrastructure, to take every opportunity I have uh, to discuss with uh, colleagues from, from everywhere and anywhere that certainly want to have a look at what we do. And it's not just about investment, it's also about learning from experiences. Um, certainly, some of the agencies we spoke to in China recently uh, wanted to learn about car parking and traffic congestion. Uh, we were keen to learn about active travel initiatives. Uh, so I think there's, there, there is great uh, positivity to be had. Uh, and I am I am aware that the First and Deputy First Ministers are travelling uh, to China uh, next month. Uh, Michelle McLevine, the Agriculture and Rural Minister, has, has just returned. As I say, China is fastly becoming a global superpower, it has been for some time. Uh, I would be remiss, uh, as Government Ministers, not to engage uh, with, with such a power. Thank you. Question 6 has been withdrawn. We move on to question 7. Call Mr. Patrick McLoone. Uh, Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, <clears throat> can I ask the Minister if he is anticipating any funding um, from the Chancellor in the Chancellor's autumn statement? statement? Minister. I think we're all probably anticipating a bit of funding from the autumn's Chancellor's statement, but yes, certainly the, the members touch upon, and there has been much speculation that there's going to be some sort of infrastructure stimulus or something, I guess, is going to be announced. But as I say, uh, any notion or any commentary in such an idea is pure speculation at this stage. Mr. Bedlone, supplementary. Uh, thanks very much, Minister. Um, has your department or anyone acting on behalf of your department engaged with the Chancellor's Office with a view to the anticipation of such funding or putting together a request for such funding? Yeah. Well, the Department, as you would probably be well aware, continually engage with uh, administrations right across the devolved areas and, of course, uh, the Treasury, uh, around, certainly around uh, any issues coming out of Brexit. But my Brexit unit within the Department uh, will be continually engaged with uh, officials uh, from London, and we will continue to do so, because uh, as we mo move forward from uh, the statement and, of course, our own budgetary process, it is important that as Minister for Infrastructure, we know that infrastructure, of course, is vital in growing a regionally balanced economy, uh, that we get as much money into my budget lines as we possibly can. I call Mr George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Can, can the Minister state what action his department is taking to, to secure rural bus routes? Minister. 
Yes. Uh, well, the member will, of course, be uh, referring to rural bus routes uh, and their department's relationship with Translink. Uh, I have had regular engagements with Chris Conway, the chief executive of Translink, since coming into post. As I say, entering this budgetary process, th those engagements will obviously increase as we look uh, to set uh, a budget line for Translink that can sustain uh, bus routes, not just in the urban areas, of course. And I, you know, I am aware, obviously, that. In recent times, we've had big announcements over the Belfast Transport Hub, uh, the Rapid Transit, obviously, for Belfast City Centre. Uh, but it's important that our rural services in areas right across the north are protected uh, and that we do all that we can to get, as I say, vital funding and adequate funding uh, into Translink to be able to deliver those services. Mr. Robinson, <coughs> supplementary. Thank the Minister for his, his answer. And would the Minister agree that rural bus routes help to maximise social inclusion where individuals do not have access to their own vehicles? Yeah, absolutely, and that's what public transport is all about. Uh, you know, and it's very important that you know we continue to see an increase in people who uh, take the opportunity to use public transport. Um, you know, it's it's on many occasions. You know, our, our metro service is very, very, very popular here in the city in, in Belfast. Our gold liner service is very popular with commuters, uh, but we could probably do more when it comes to our rural services with Ulster Bus. Uh, and I think we need to look at ways to be able to enhance the services on offer, to protect the services on offer, and try and get as many people as we can using those particular services. Thank you. I call uh, Mr. Chris Little for a quick question, an even quicker answer, probably no supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he can clarify the funding position on the York Street interchange project? Minister. Uh, well, again, without stepping over the embargo for the, for the ministerial statement tomorrow, I will reiterate what I have said all along uh, when it comes to the York Street interchange. It is strategically a very important project. It is important. It's a project I, I want to be able to deliver, uh, and I took the decision to, to lengthen the procurement period so that I can take all available advice. And as the change, we've seen the landscape even with Brexit has changed with High Court rulings and, and since I have taken that decision. Uh, and I'm hoping that the member will uh, pay close attention to the ministerial statement tomorrow. Thank you. Time is up. We must move.